So the biblical model from the way we see it is the man really listens to the woman and the woman really listens to herself. And, and she sets the pace and he r rides the waves with her and then really they both enjoy it and they're both happy. Welcome to the Get Your Marriage On podcast. I'm your host, Dan Purcell, a Christian marriage and intimacy expert and coach. I'm on a mission to help couples have the best sex and most emotionally intimate marriages possible. Our episodes cover topics you've always wondered about and are packed with practical advice designed to help you take your marriage to the next level. My wife and I both grew up in good homes, but stereotypical to most that grew up in a conservative Christian culture in the 80s and 90s, conversations around sex were usually limited to either biological reproduction or staying pure from sexual thoughts. These messages served me well before we were married, but after we were married, we realized that these models led to anxiety about sexuality and difficulty within our own sexual relationship. These issues didn't really surface until after a decade into our marriage, when we weren't so entrenched in survival mode from raising young kids, you know, all the time, and we could actually take a breath and focus on our relationship. I'm grateful for the many resources that helped me grow my understanding of marriage and sex in marriage, specifically where at first I thought spirituality and sexuality were incompatible. The examples of teachers like my guest today on this podcast episode you're about to hear Help me see that spirituality and sexuality actually go together. Fast forward a few years, I'm grateful for the privilege of coaching other couples in growing their marriage intimately. It's now what I do full time for work, and I hope that this podcast, our apps, retreats, workshops, and other resources that we have are helping you build a stronger marriage. One of the common issues I see with my clients as a marriage coach is how quote unquote duty sex or viewing sex as something just for the man, for example, often limits the couple's ability to grow sexually. Another issue I see a lot in my coaching is how one's interpretation of biblical teachings around sex are often antithetical to building an intimate marriage. Another issue I see has to do with sexual performance and pressure and the sexual dysfunction connected with that. We get to talk about all these things and much more in this episode today with Dr. Clifford and Joyce Penner. As my guests will attest, getting away for a weekend once in a while can really nourish your marriage, especially if it's a marriage retreat where you can learn about how to have a more intimate and fulfilling sex life, developing closer friendship, meet other couples who are on a similar journey, learn new skills on how to deal with conflict better, and most importantly, have fun together. Our next retreat is four days and three nights long, October 26 through 29 in the Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas area. Register now so you don't miss it by going to getyourmarriageon.com, click on Retreats, then DFW Retreat. If you're on the fence or you're not sure about it, go to the webpage anyway and check out the videos shared by past retreat attendees sharing their experience so you get a really good feel for what it's all about. Joyce and Cliff Penner. Thank you for coming on the Get Your Marriage On podcast. How are you today? Great, thank you. We're really looking forward to this, so yes. we're ready to go. Excellent. I want to know, what's something unique about the two of you? Well, the first thing that comes to mind when you ask that is, we were both raised as Mennonites. Uh huh. And the Mennonites are not known for their flamboyance. No, very conservative <laughs> religion, very yes. Uh -huh. Very conservative. Yes. In fact story I would tell there is that that shortly before my mother died, maybe she died at 91, probably when she was 89 or 90, she called and said, I have an apology to make to you that you ended up, and I said, what's this about? She said that you ended up doing what you do. She couldn't say what we did, the uh -huh. sex therapist. She said, because it, she must have failed as a mother. Uh -huh. if, would, and would, I would be doing what we do. Because if she'd have been a good mother, I'd have ended up being either a pastor, a missionary, or a musician. <laughs> Certainly not doing what we do. And then what was fun is we were getting an award at the American Association of Christian Counselors for the Caregiver of the Year. And this had happened right shortly before that. And they said, you've got two minutes to tell a story. So Cliff told this story. 
And it was so fun because everyone came up afterwards and said. There were like five, 6,000 people in the audience. And you know, everywhere everyone, we went from that moment on, they kept saying, well, be sure to tell your mother how much you've helped us. What a good thing it is you're doing and all this kind of stuff. And then we could always call her on her way home from speaking somewhere. And we told her the story. And she said, well, did you at least have my picture up? Uh, so she she wanted to get some coverage for it. <laughs> that's great. So, that's great. Okay. But anyway, but the but it is unusual to have a couple of people from very conservative Mennonite backgrounds being the ones going around talking about open, healthy sexuality in mm -hmm. the church and in the Christian community. And yeah. uh, we all do say God had a real sense of humor when He called us to this task which has been so rewarding for us, very rewarding. That's good. I could totally relate to that experience. I don't think my parents are super excited about what I'm doing too. What you're doing? Yeah. <laughs> well, then again, I'm sure they're proud of me. But yeah, and also I think God has a sense of humor in all of us. We, we feel like this is a calling in a way and something yes. we, we work towards. And we see so much how it helps so many people. Like yeah. Exactly. And it's, it's, it's about creating deeper relationships that last for generations. That's why it's so valuable. Right. And when we first got called to this in 1975, there weren't people like you around. And no. so since then, it really has blossomed and so many more people are being reached, which we feel great about having you and many others doing what you're doing in terms of podcasts. And Cliff, you're a clinical psychologist, and Joyce, you're a, you're a nurse. Mm -hmm. Clinical nurse specialist in psychosomatic medicine and nursing education. But yes. that, again, our preparation wasn't for this. It just happened, and our preparation actually well prepared us for what we got called to do. But I, I had already had my doctorate for four or five years before we even got into Old sexual area. And I was a professor at a university and then helping develop the curriculum to start a school of nursing at the Christian University here. Wow. So, that's good. And then in 1981, you published your first book. Yes. That was Gift of Sex. Mm -hmm. And we had no idea about that, but that's just the first of 11 books. Right. That. And we had never written. And so... If people will ask, you know, how do you get a publisher? We've never gotten a publisher. They've gotten us. Oh, right. So each step of the way, we were pulled and pushed to do what we're doing. Uh, it never came out of our plan or intention, but our openness to being willing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Very good. And you've also written columns for the LA Times? And Yes. And yep. uh, yeah, I mean... Hey. I did a tally um, during COVID. I did a tally and turned out that we had done over 700 seminars over the years. That's incredible. It's crazy. And all over the world. Yeah, because we had never even traveled out of North America. And then we got called to teach in Germany and Switzerland and then Singapore and Bali and Jakarta and Philippines, Philippines and, and Australia and everywhere. Yeah. So that, it's been great. Congratulations. That's incredible. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Great yes. fun. All right. We have a great fun discussion today. And these are probably things you mm -hmm. teach in your seminars and in your books and probably as you mm -hmm. counsel individuals. I want to get a better understanding. What is your interpretation of a biblical model for how a great, healthy sexual relationship should be? Well, first of all, that scripture teaches throughout all the New Testament passages, concept of mutuality. And that starts with Galatians 3.28, where it says, Now because of Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. In other words, You're because the system, had, Jesus. the system had been that it was a male-dominant system in the Old Testament. And now because of Christ, that division between man and woman had been broken down. And so every passage in the New Testament teaches about mutuality. Best example of that is, is the fifth chapter of Ephesians, where it starts off, be subject one to another, one to another, 
And often that passage is, stops when it tells the woman is to submit to her husband. And that's what's used to give the duty sex mentality so much to women who are raised in the church. And but yet, there's just one verse about that, and then there are about 12 verses about how the husband is supposed to behave. And that is, he's supposed to love her like Christ loved the church, which means giving himself up for her. Giving not, up his rights. Not claiming his rights. And then Paul says a really interesting thing. He quotes Genesis 2.24, Therefore a man leaves his father and mother, clings to his wife, and the two become one. And then he says, but this is a great mystery, and I'm speaking in reference to Christ and the church. And then he says, but keep in mind, men, that when you do this, you're really just doing yourself a favor. Why that? Because there's nothing that makes a man happier than a happy sexual woman, a turned on woman. And when a, a woman feels loved in a giving way, like well, we talk and, about. And that he's really getting with her where she is, even if. Sex is, it is not something she's enjoying at the time. Eventually, she will start enjoying it. But when she comes with that duty model, it's hard to see it as something for her. And then she doesn't really get into enjoying it. He gets anxious. He tries to fix her. The more he tries to fix her, the less she, good she feels about herself. And women usually enjoy sex most when they feel good about themselves rather than when there's something wrong with them sexually. So that's why Paul says, if you can love your wife like this, you're really just doing yourself a favor because it'll make you feel good ah. and be happy. But so it isn't sacrifice, it's serving. Yeah, it, but it, it isn't just about the man. Yes, a man enjoys an ejaculation. That's, that's standard. But unless the woman is enjoying it, it's not complete. It's not fulfilling. And so that's and men, most men feel that, but then they try so hard to fix her so she will and and enjoy it as much as he is. But in the, trying to fix her, she feels worse about herself. So then she can't really do it. So if he just loves her where she is and lets her lead and lets her teach him about herself and, and listen to her own body, that be the, the pace and how they continue. So the biblical model from the way we see it is the man really listens to the woman and the woman really listens to herself. And, and she and, sets the pace and he r rides the waves with her and then really they both enjoy it and they're both happy. That sounds good. There's even a physiological explanation for the exact same thing too. What, what I mean by that is... Just biologically speaking, women take 25 minutes on average Long. of stimulation to reach orgasm compared right. to six minutes for a man. So there, yeah. there's that too. And biologically speaking, women are smaller than men. Sex is more vulnerable for them. One sexual encounter for a man may be just a few minutes and be done. Where for a woman, it could turn into nine months in pregnancy, 18 years of child rearing. Like there's a lot more vulnerability at stake <laughs> for a woman. So of course- if she's yeah. going to let a man into her heart or even into her body, there's got to yeah. be a, a good emotional connection there yes. in order for that to well, work there's, out. Th there's <laughs> another thing about the difference between men and women there, and that is as a man reaches the point of, of climax, of excitement, of ejaculation, it's outside his body. And as a woman right. reaches that point, she goes more and more internal. So it's, it's really an a very internal event for the woman. Right. It's, in many ways, it's an external event for the man. And that's why it's so important that she learn to know her body, understand it, and be able to listen to it so she can lead and communicate what she likes. But she needs space for that and a helping hand to really understand Literally it. Literally and figuratively. Uh, yes. yeah. <laughs> I was hoping that was a double entendre there. <laughs> Another yeah, exactly. symbol I like, and I've heard you say this before, is if you look at the book of Genesis, marriage, that union of man and woman, is in Genesis 2, mm -hmm. where the fall of Adam it begins in Genesis 3. So before sin even came into the world, the sanctity of he sex was established first. Yes. 
In fact, the commandment to multiply and replenish came before don't eat of the right. forbidden fruit. So, Well, and, and to get back to your question of what the biblical picture of, of a healthy sexuality is, we, we always end up in mutuality. It has to be as good for both, or for, for one as it is for the other, if it's going to be fulfilling for a lifetime. That's just the reality. I like that. Another, this is just another one of many interpretations, but when God took from Adam's side a rib to form the woman, symbolically speaking, where my wife and I, when we stand side by side, it's rib to rib. So there's that concept mm -hmm. of mutuality, like we're to go through life side by side as partners, equal partners right. in life through this. Right. The other thing that I think is good to point out we go on a lot longer on this, just ending here. The relationship between God and his people, Israel, is often pictured in terms of sexual terms in the Old Testament. It talks about when, when Israel was unfaithful, pouring after other gods, when, she, when God was talking about his love for Israel, talking about bathing her in oil and in, in very sexual terms. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, in the, in the New Testament, the comparison is made between Christ and the church and the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife, that massive intimate connection that mm -hmm. is there. And so that's just one more picture yes. of uh, understanding. And one of the difficulties, especially today, is when men have grown up as boys seeing, learning about sex on pornography. And that is not what married sex is, and it's not about intimacy. And many times they are really baffled by what it requires to be a husband to a wife sexually. Yeah, there's a reality intimacy. gap there. Yes. Uh -huh. The real reality gap. Yep. Yep. Wow, that's great. How do you coach couples? Let's say here's a scenario where I'm going to just use stereotypes here. And I understand that it's not like this for most couples. But the stereotype I'm going to give here is the wife has kind of grown up with this idea of there's somewhat of a duty to perform. A good wife gives her body to yes. her husband. And then for a number of reasons, it could be like I've heard him like, so he doesn't stray. So he doesn't look at pornography or because I need to right. So he doesn't get so he doesn't get in a bad mood. Uh, oh yeah, exactly. It's about managing him, right? So they'll use yeah, sex as a way yeah. to manage it. On the other hand, so the husband, in a way, recognizes this isn't what I want. I want to be desired, not just to be placated. I don't want perfunctory duty here. I want intimacy and closeness. Right. Any counsel you'd give this couple, what are things that the husband needs to know? Maybe things he's doing to perpetuate the cycle in his own relationship unwittingly. Things that the wife needs to understand and realize so she can kind of break out of the cycle to have something a little more intimate and fulfilling. Right. Ha helping the husband see his part in this without him feeling blamed is tricky sometimes. And we have to be very caring and empathetic and listen to him while we also try to guide him to what she really needs if his needs are going to be met. Uh, and just understanding some education is important. For example, many husbands will say, I want her to want me like I want her. Well, that's, again, a difference between a male and a female. Most women aren't interested in sex because they want their husband so badly. They're more interested in sex because of what's inside of them. So as they feel loved and intimate and connected with and get turned on inside, then they want to express it with the husband. But it isn't like, I want her to desire me. And that's sometimes hard to make that shift. Yeah, but if we, if we just take this kind of simplistically, crassly, if the man walks through the bedroom naked, it's not necessarily going to turn the woman on. No. If, the, woman walks, if the woman walks through the bedroom naked, he's ready. Yes. <laughs> and in fact, some wedding night stories we've had are quite interesting. When the man grew up and the woman grew up in the same culture as we grew up. And uh, 
<laughs> when he comes out of the bedroom and she's freaked out. Oh, <laughs> uh, right. So. Whoa, what's that? <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, right, right, right. right. So, I heard some, another guest once said she is far more interested in the size of his heart than the sign of, size of his penis. Like, absolutely. I think that's a, absolutely. Men, that's a great way. And right. men feel insecure about that. Mm-hmm. They can know. Well, and then that so, brings us to something that, that we see kind of regularly in our practice, and that is men who come to marriage believing that somehow the, the woman's response to him and desire for him is going to fill the emptiness in his heart. And, that's another thing, yes. And that's what we call it, the, the sexually needy man who is looking for affirmation. Looking Validation. Looking for affirmation. Mm-hmm. Else, as, as now he finally got somebody who is worshiping him. And that's... Well, I might just say often that this man has either been raised in a home where he didn't feel that from mom. He didn't feel like she really adored him. And or he's had a very traumatic experience with women or a woman and being rejected. And now he's finally married. Maybe he saved himself for marriage. And he's trying to get his that empty place in his heart filled. And he watches her constantly. Does she want me? Is she smiling? Does she desire me? Was that as good an orgasm as last time? Oh, you only had two because the last time you had three. Uh, so he's watching, always comparing and watching, and, and how she and that's responds. A killer. Yeah, that'll that'll ruin the sex life because now all of a sudden she's an object that's being observed rather than a person that she's connecting with, engaged. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Great. Those are good uh, thoughts for the man. How about for the woman to break away from the duty sex mentality? Yes, the more she can. Well, we encourage them first of all to read out loud to each other the Married Guy's Guide to Great Sex, which will teach in much more detail what we've just been talking about. Which I have in my hand right here. Mm -hmm. Good. good. And enjoy what we encourage them to read out loud together is enjoy the gift of sexual pleasure for women. And many women, even the title, The Gift of Sexual Pleasure, feels like that's not for them. That's an oxymoron. It's, it's, it's not a gift for her. Yep. And But we encourage her to read it because we talk about why it's not a gift and how to make that transition to it being for her. And mm-hmm. so they read those out loud together. And we want to say the reason for reading them out loud is there's a brain reason for that. When we have something set in our brain, an emotion that controls our body or our mentality, it's usually swirling around in the right hemisphere of our brain. When we verbalize, it has to shift across the midline to the left, the verbal center, which has less control over our emotions and our body. And so by reading out loud and talking about it to each other, they can really reset some of those patterns. And for the woman who came with the duty sex mentality, that will be important. And it won't just change in a moment. It's going to take some time for that to set in and for her to realize she can listen to herself. And But some things do have to change for him. If he gets moody, Every time she doesn't do her duty, then she's going to have a hard time shifting. So we always start with the married guy's guide, but maybe both of them at the same time. But the thing that that I think you were going somewhere and then uh, we didn't say is what's important for the woman is to not think of it as a duty to him, but as a duty to herself, if you will. To, to get in touch with what she's feeling inside and what her needs are, rather than being focused on his needs, being focused on hers, because then and she, guiding him, letting and then him, guiding know. him know what is going to bring her the most pleasure. Because sometimes women say, you know, if he loved me, he'd figure it out. Well, that's not quite how it works. No, uh-uh. <laughs> you have not found that just because he loves her, he figures it out. She's got to share with him what's mm-hmm. going on inside for her. And she's got to lead him with that. Not not demanding, not controlling, 
lead with a soft sexuality that guides him. I can see your psychosomatic training at work in a little bit of this too. Like many men too, but women in this context, what we're talking about, have this disconnect with their body of some sort. Yes. They're not. Yes. They don't tune in to their own, to their own selves, their own core. Right. Right. And we often have to deal, and that's where my psychosomatic medicine training really helps too, with women's body image. It isn't always how the world sees them, but how they see themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've had women who, by all external standards, were absolutely gorgeous, who had very negative views of their body yeah. and, and, yeah. And, and how it was perceived. Mm-hmm. So it is not what you see on the picture or what, what's seen in the mirror. It what, what in, it feels inside. like inside. Right. And probably on the opposite end of the spectrum too, maybe by the world standard, not the most beautiful, but they've accepted themselves fully and they love yes, their body. Absolutely. Yes. They've learned how yes. to, they, they're at that right. point. They had that too. Yes. Yeah, in fact, I think I'd tell a quick story here. had a, a couple come to us is 30 years ago now, and they were both what my all description would be called very large people. Uh-huh. And uh, we tra- trained it very carefully about talking about body the, image. the lobby image and standing in, in front of a mirror in the nude. Oh, they said, oh, no, that's no problem for us. We just love being together in the nude and, and, and then are totally had, happy with their bodies. And then we had a model come in with her husband. They both look like models. And she just broke out in sobs when we mentioned standing in front of the mirror and talking about your body. So the one we were supposed to be careful with by it. Our society standard was not a problem. The one we should have been careful with was a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to take a big risk here and tell a personal story to, to those okay. listening. Go for it. Uh, so many years ago when my wife and I were understanding better our sexual relationship and, and we're starting to progress a little bit, I, I don't know about you, but progress in life, not just sexually, but just in life always feels like two steps forward, one step back. But yeah, it's not a <laughs> straight. It's not line. linear. Yeah. No. <laughs> so um, being the nerd that I am, I got, I wanted to track how often we were having sex, how often we're having date well, night, things like that. <laughs> which my wife, is, I wasn't done in secret. We had in our master closet on the wall, we had a big calendar and we were having fun just tracking these things. It was a together thing. It wasn't kind of behind yeah, our back. Yeah. But what yeah. it turned into... And not only would I record when we had sex, but I'd record when I had an orgasm compared to her. Because when we had sex, almost always I would have an orgasm, but it was rare for her. And I, I took it as a, I took it to mean something about my own performance, like my own, like my own batting average, so to speak. Yeah. And I I remember one day taking a look at my batting average and I think I was like one in 18 or something like that. And I meant, and I made it mean something like I'm a horrible lover. Like, and then I read stories of how other women have like two or three orgasms or many, you know, it's just like, this is all on me. This is my fault. And so I, I made it my project. And so, you know where this is (laughs) heading, right? What happened, what ended up happening is my batting average got worse. And, uh, my bat also didn't perform. <laughs> it, it broke. <laughs> I, I experienced erectile dysfunction because I was so anxious about every sexual encounter. Like, I need to, like, do this. This needs to happen. She needs to do that. And, and if she experienced any dislike of, like, a move I was making, I would take it so personally. And... So she obviously isn't enjoying these experiences either, right? It's a horrible experience for both of us. And that's the time a friend recommended your book. Um, Not because they knew about this, but I was reading in here. And you have a great section here about... Right. Yeah, about keeping score and things like that. And I got to say, this one phrase turned it around for me. And it's... Don't let your definition of success depend on involuntary responses of your body that you can't control. And I'm a goal-oriented person. I like setting goals. And I had made this goal of increasing my average or my performance, right? 
but I was basing my goal solely on something I had absolutely zero control over. I wouldn't set a goal in work or fitness or something. Or like, I won't set a goal that tomorrow's going to be a sunny day. Like, I don't have control over tomorrow's weather, right? It just, yeah, I was doing that in my own sexual life and it was causing all these problems. So, how did you turn it around? Well, I stopped the calendar. That's the first thing I did. I stopped looking at it, I stopped using that. And it, I, I'd like to say it was an overnight change, but it wasn't for me. Yeah. But it maybe within a few weeks, instead, in the moment, I, instead of focusing, I was so anxious and I was so preoccupied by my wife's experience because I was preoccupied with myself. I, I think I'm being selfless, right? Trying to be a giving lover, but really it's about me. That's at the heart. It's, it's really about me. There's, uh, there's narcissism in it. Like it's, uh, it, it's about me. It appears to be about her, but it's really about once I could just let that go and say, I'm here to have a good time. I'm just here to enjoy connection. And once I made connection my main emphasis, all of a sudden, guess what happened to both of us? We started performing better. Oh, yes. we both started performing better. And then batting average naturally <laughs> improved yeah. significantly. That is so good. Yes. We had, we had a couple come to us in 1976. We're, we're old. So we're aging ourselves here. But, uh, and it was the, the uh, year of the bicentennial. Oh, so yes. They had, uh -huh. had, they had, had a great, they came actually in February of 77 because they had decided they had a great sex life and they were going to have sex 200 times in 1976. Oh, good for them. Uh huh. That's a lot. Yeah. Of, yeah. And, and, by, and then by, by October, they were only up to about 70. And so now by from, from, from the middle of October to December, they were supposed to have 130 experiences. And next thing you knew, the guy had erectile dysfunction. Yes. They came to us reporting erectile dysfunction. But we think it's just like that. But it's such a good example because it was just about trying to get 200 in a certain amount of time. And it's, it's a variation on your calendar, your calendar story. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Once free them out of that and point out it didn't require much therapy. It just required resetting their thinking like you and not focusing on the number, but enjo the enjoyment they had before they started. Well, counting. the thing we have to underscore is it, I know it, you felt under pressure, but she also has to have felt under pressure. Oh, of course. You're yes. pressure. Because now, not only was she supposed to hurry up and have an orgasm, but or at least for, for herself, I mean, but was she was also supposed to make you happy by yes. having one. Right. And so, so it produced anxiety for both, not right. just for you, but also for her. Yeah. And moved in the exact opposite direction of what you wanted. And sometimes this also happens when couples have infertility struggles and Yes. You know, there's not much they can do about that. It does have to happen at a certain time. You know, you have to way. get together at 2.15 a.m. <laughs> Ovulation, on right on, to, on schedule. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you've got to do it in, in some strange position, yeah. hanging from the rafters. <laughs> you know, always try to bridge. That's my favorite position. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. We're struggling with that to, Kind of function on two tracks. One is the fertility track, and the other is just having the, fun. The track. pleasure track, and yes. just have lots of fun together on the side. Be that doesn't because have the any fertility fun. track is, in many ways, functional. And it's about producing an ejaculation at a given moment in time, yes. and uh, which is appropriate to get pregnant, but but and we've unnecessary. Had many, but we've had many pregnant. couples come to us after they got pregnant and now had the baby and all, but their sex life didn't return to what it was before because they had made such a shift in having functional sex that they weren't able to get back to it to have the pleasure sex. And that was like the shift that you made. Yes, yes. Any other things related to what goes on inside our heads that you see are common issues or any other stories related to, you know, Making sex more about that pleasure sex, more about that enjoyment that come to mind for you. Well, well the, the, I think just talking about the pleasure part, one of the things that, that we always try to teach couples is that, that the goal in sex is, is not about getting aroused for the man or the woman. 
or about having an orgasm for the man or the woman. Or even about having intercourse. Even though those are good, good and positive and enjoyable things to do. But those aren't the goals. The goals are the pleasure of the experience. And then the arousal, the orgasm, the intercourse is a byproduct of the goal, which is the connection, uh, feelings, the, the intimacy, the plus that's, yes, the cherishing. The two, be the two become one in the real biblical sense of spirituality, sexuality, physical part, all coming together and enjoying. We think the Song of Solomon is a great picture of that because in the Song of Solomon, he's always the one adoring her and telling her how much he likes this part of her body and that part of her body, and this response and that response. response. And she's saying, come on, let's get going. She's trying to move it along. Uh -huh. She's saying, let's go into the orchard and see if the pomegranates have blossomed. She's well, seeking him out in the city. Where is he? Uh-huh. Right. Watchman, yeah. have you seen yeah. him? Uh-huh. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so she's, she's reading it. She's wanting more. Yes. And uh, it's a great picture. And he keeps telling her how her nose looks like a flock of goats or whatever he tells. Let <laughs> <laughs> me drew a picture of that passage, how it would really look if, if you drew it. <laughs> well, she, she was not very attractive. <laughs> but one thing we do have to say for all of this to work, there has to be a willingness and ability to heal from past hurts. Yes. If one or both brought something into the marriage or something has happened in the marriage uh, that has caused trauma or hurt, that needs to be addressed. And so let's just be specific, obviously not getting into all of it, but if there's been physical sexual abuse in the past, that there needs to be healing from that almost inevitably before a couple can have a fulfilling sex life. Yes. Two, if somebody was raised in an alcoholic home, but particularly with an alcoholic father, a, a woman may well have learned to shut down. Not let her, herself be in, out of control because be, the father was out of control. Or, yes. Or, or maybe the mother could be that one was mentally ill and emotionally out of control. So when you have an emotionally out of control home that the person was raised in, then the person has to be their own control on themselves. And so then they shut down. So it gets scary when their bodies get out of control. Yes. And to be responsive orgasmically, it is about getting out of control of that part. You have to let it happen. And then pain is a big one. And so many times, even if the woman isn't having pain anymore, if it started with pain. We're talking about physical pain. Physical now. Yes. Pain. Mm -hmm. If it started with pain, uh, she may have shut everything down because it's supposed to feel good. If it not only doesn't feel good, but it actually really hurts. Who's going to desire that? You're right. not going to desire it. And she starts self-protecting and not getting into it because it hurts. And sometimes there are men will say, well, you know how women are. It's all in their head. Or maybe and, and she's we just have never, making an excuse. In, in 45 years of doing this, we have never discovered a situation where her pain was in her head. It was yes. always in her vagina, right where she said it was, and it hurt. And uh, so that idea that, that this is just today's excuse um, that we doesn't work at all. highly recommend that if, if it's painful, don't continue doing anything that's painful until you get help with relief of that pain and treatment yes. for that. And, and then I guess one other category, when there has been some... Uh, relational hurt. You know, let's say somebody was in, engaged and then that broke up or somebody in their dating life or engaged life was unfaithful or something like that, where they've never really dealt with that pain and gone past it. The, the that can be a real psychological pain. Yeah. yeah, that would be a, the emotional pain, the physical. And that needs to get dealt with. So those things need to be dealt with as one of the steps toward wholeness. But then uh, when everything is working, even in a normal, wonderful sex life, we have children, we have duties, we have many things. That Sickness, talk. we have illness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, many things that distract us. And so we feel like it's, you're going to have a lot more fun in the bedroom if you're intentional about it, not keeping your calendar, 
but making sure that we practice our formula for intimacy, which isn't about having sex, but just making time for each other. It isn't what you do during that time and whether you perform or achieve, but having time cut out for the two of us. And when we call it a formula for intimacy, that sounds formulaic, which yes. it is. We Let's hear it. Explain. Let's hear the formula. <laughs> you mean that? Yes. yes. So it starts with the most important part from our perspective is taking 15 minutes a day. And there is a, the formula is really based on sex in the brain studies. And you start by looking into each other's eyes and sharing something positive, either an affirmation of each other, something that you feel good about yourself, something that a Bible verse you heard or some way that you enjoyed the kids or God spoke to you. But it could be spiritual, could be many things. It's just not about duty or getting who's going to pick up the dry cleaning or who's going to take care of the kids tonight or did you get a babysitter. It isn't that. It's just looking into each other's eyes. And the reason is because when we look into each other's eyes, just like parents with infants, it, your brain secretes oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone. So that creates the feeling of intimacy and closeness. And then uh, wherever you are spiritually, whatever you're coming for, connect spiritually in some way, whether that's reading a Scripture passage, a verse, a uh, couple's devotional, having a prayer together, just briefly. And this is all, you can do this all in 15 minutes. So it's not a long, drawn out thing. We do this for men because, it, and sometimes guys will say, geez, if we start this, you know, I know it'll run for two hours. We say, set the timer. Yeah. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. That's it. And you can even do it while the kids are playing around. It doesn't, you don't, this doesn't have to be done in the privacy. It's so, good for kids. So there's the eye-to-eye connection, the spiritual connection. Bringing God into it. And then, and then connecting physically. And start with a, a full body hug, front to front. It's a, a, real, a real hug. Really get not, in. It's not, we said not a Southern Baptist hug. Not like that. <laughs> uh-huh. It's a real hug. <laughs> And, uh, and some of our best it. friends are Southern Baptists. So don't take right, personal right. people. But and and you might just turn on a timer because they found that if it's a twenty second full body hug front to front, your body gives a huge surge of oxytocin. So that's the bonding, and then kiss, and that's kissing creates the dopamine, which is the excited hormone, the turned on, whatever. But for some, kissing is negative or has been negative. So you have to start with just lips to lips, if that's the case, but then gradually include more of the mouth and really get into it, linger and, and kiss. We're talking about passionate kissing. For five so we to say, 30 seconds. We say if you can hug for 20 seconds and kiss passionately for 30 seconds, not with the purpose that this is going to now lead to sex. This is just leading to connection. Because so many times I've taught a lot of mothers of preschooler classes over the years. And women will say, but if I kiss him, he gets all turned on. And then we ha- then I know we're going to have sex. So what I do in my mind is when he comes up and wants to kiss me, I think, oh, do I want to have sex tonight? And if she isn't sure, then she turns her cheek. And so that's why we created this formula for intimacy where kissing is included not as a signal that I want to have sex tonight, but just as part of the connecting and letting, giving yourself, knowing it doesn't have anything to do with whether you want sex or not. You may Sometimes have- it may, but other times it may not. And it should never be expected. So that's, that's the first 15 minutes a day thing. And, and we know that no one's going to do it seven days a week, 365 days a year. But if you get into a pattern, of that on a regular basis, that is going to make a difference. Yes. And then one evening a week, whether you walk together, uh, where you do get time without the kids, uh, either get a babysitter once they're done. And we're not saying sex once a week. No, there's not. Maybe, maybe it's sex once a week, but maybe it's sex three times a week or once a month. Do something fun. Go on a date if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Do something that do, do something you both enjoy. That's a treat for everybody. And then at least once a quarter, have, a, have at least a day 
that is set aside for the two of you. And, and once a year, for sure, a whole weekend that is set aside for just the two of you. And maybe do something like attend a marriage seminar or uh, read a book to go away and read a book together. Something mm -hmm. that's going to enhance your relationship. Great. So, and just a plug in for my marriage of... retreats. They're a great weekend for a couple to come to right. my retreat. Yeah. So. <laughs> good. 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 Where do you do those? Our next retreat is in October in Dallas, Fort Worth area. Oh, oh, wonderful. Is that where you're from? No, I'm from Southern Utah. And we have retreats in the spring in Southern Utah, too. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. Good. good. Well, yeah. It, yeah. It, we strongly believe that, that. that That's if great. a couple can have Something that they devote at least one weekend a year to that it's just about their marriage. And it could be about the relationship part. It could be about communication. It could be resolving conflict. It could be about sex, whatever. It, it's a necessary part. And when couples, we have found many reports, when, when we had done with the same, we teach weekend seminars Friday night and all day Saturday. And, and then later couples will come to us and say, you know, you gave us a lot of helpful things in that weekend, but the one thing that has made the most difference is our 15 minutes a day, every day. Yes, and, uh, I believe it. Well, That's a fantastic formula. And when I can personally endorse, because when I learned it, I think I learned it late 2018. So since 2019, my wife and I have been consistent at that. At least the daily connection piece is really important. But for us, it was the, it was the getaway. We, we try to get away for a weekend every quarter. and that. Mm -hmm. With young kids, sometimes finding a brave soul to watch six children has been really daunting. Oh, wow. <laughs> but uh, we've somehow, one way or another, like miracles happen. The paths, the doors were open, paths were created. We we're able to get away. And it just gives our marriage just a good reset every single time. We really look forward to those times together. That's great. That's great. Well, um, that's that's a Good thing to end on because yes. we strongly believe that that virtually any couple can have a fulfilling sexual life if they're willing to commit themselves to the work that that takes. And also adjust their expectations that not every sex life is going to look the same. Different stages of life, different situation, it may be different, but it doesn't have to have a specific goal that you have to achieve. It's just that it's mutually good for both and that the woman learns to get with herself and lead and he gets with her and that they take time to build their intimacy together and we have high hopes for everyone. Excellent. Very good. Where can people go to find you? Our website is passionatecommitment.com and Joyce responds to people virtually every day from around the world that write emails and that, and that's we'll the, call our home office number. That's uh -huh. our free service. And then they can also order our books from there. And we've got a whole bunch of frequently asked questions and all that kind of thing is passionate commitment.com. We're the building easiest. that more all the time. So we've got somebody helping us with that. Excellent. Very good. Well, this has been a time great pleasure. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> Thank what a great you. conversation. Yeah. I know. We'll look forward to having more of them. All right. Sounds good. Thank you for listening to today's Thank you episode. For listening to if you're today's interested episode, in accelerating in growth in your marriage, in your marriage, or sexually, emotionally, or sexually, emotionally, I want to invite you to work with me in my affordable coaching program called Next Level. More information about Next Level and my fun and sexy apps for couples are available at getyourmarriageon.com. Please also don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss a And be sure to tell your married friends. And be sure to tell your married friends. They will thank you for life. They will thank you for life. Go get your marriage. Now, go get your marriage on.